Welcome back to Overcome with Justin Wren, where we talk about how to win this fight called life, how we rise up and overcome, how we uh, put love and compassion in action, how we build better lives for ourselves and for others and make this world better. I'm so excited, incredibly excited for this episode because it's awesome. It's absolutely incredible. And what's come from it is actually something incredibly special. When I was filming this podcast with Mark and Juliana of Boho Beautiful and Stars and Destruct podcast, I did not know what it was gonna turn into. But they decided to open up a fundraiser to start a campaign called The Karma Project. The Karma Project life for Fight for the Forgotten. I got to be a guest on their show, Stars and Destruct. It just launched last week and they set a $20,000 goal for Fight for the Forgotten. Well, I'm going to read you this real quick because we have had 1,233 supporters, which is, I'm blown away. People joining forces with us, donating, and getting behind Fight for the Forgotten. But they said, together we have obliterated the first $20,000 goal and have extended it to $40,000. Keep sharing, keep donating, keep being the light. We can do this. You are here for a reason. And then it says, we believe that each and every one of us holds the power to make a positive impact in our world. Well, we've raised $43,146 so far. I don't know if we're going to raise that goal, but um, we've blown through two goals already. And what I love about this is Mark and Juliana are incredible examples of how they were following their passion, which for one was athletics and for Juliana, and the other was music. And um, through maybe getting burned out a little bit, uh, they started to pursue their passion, a newfound passion in yoga together. And because of that, and their love story is documented in this episode and it's, it's awesome, but they found a way to build one of the biggest YouTube subscriptions in the world for yoga in the Boho Beautiful. And so this episode is super special to me. Um, I got to ask questions that they said they've never been asked. And so I think you're gonna get a really unique perspective. And what was birthed out of this podcast was them getting behind Fight for the Forgotten and also me being a guest on their show. So buckle up, Buttercup. Here's the episode. I'm so grateful for you. If you wanna support the project, it's on Fight for the Forgotten's website. If you go under donate or give, it's the first thing, The Karma Project, or if you go to www.thekarmaproject.life, it'll take you straight to that page. And uh, let me know what you think about this episode. Please like and follow and subscribe and leave a review. We're so grateful for you. And um, yeah, welcome back. We're like in the liner notes and like <laughs> they used to terrorize us on message boards and stuff. Cause they're like, kind of bullying. They, yeah, yeah, we got yeah. bullied hard. Yeah. Like Through it music. Was like, but like yeah. on a level yeah. where at that point, like to have a band out of obscurity that you were just in launched to like ultimate success yeah. and then spit on you from there. It was like, oh man, it's a fucking like monster. It's a mind warp. Yeah. But it allowed us to find a, a space to be like, well, what we're doing means something. Everyone you meet every single day is fighting a battle you may know nothing about. We're all in the process of overcoming. I'm Justin Wren, and my story has been heard by millions of people through my book, my TED Talk, podcast interviews, TV shows, professional fighting, and my foundation, Fight for the Forgotten. I believe we are all overcomers if we choose to overcome. We all have the option. I've been given the opportunity to overcome childhood trauma, sexual abuse, immense bullying, depression, suicidal ideation, substance use disorder, and I am a two-time suicide survivor. We are here to have conversations with some of the greatest minds of our time. Get ready to be inspired and to receive the tools and game plan to win this fight called life. Thank you for being here, for showing up for yourself. You, me, we have overcome 100% of our darkest days. I'm not done yet, and neither are you. This is your invitation to overcome. All right, welcome back to Overcome with Justin Wren. I have two really, really special guests with me. And I think I might start it off differently than I ever have. I think Good, you right? guys have a pretty beautiful relationship. And this is just like what you named Xavier, the bringer of light. Like yes. me being around y'all, it's just a oh. lot of light. Aww. 
And so I'm going to have Mark introduce the one that you love. Tell me a little bit about her and our audience <laughs> wow. too and why you love her. And then we'll switch it uh, to the other way. That's wow. beautiful. What a great way to start. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> never done that, but I think, okay. think it would be I love it. something special. I don't know if I've ever done that either. That's so, oh my goodness. Well, this is, this is my life partner and soulmate, Juliana. Juliana, now Spickluck. We are married. Uh, I think, I believe we got married the moment we met, the moment wow. we laid eyes on each other. Our life shifted in a really special way. Um, and we've been on a journey together for 10 years. Um, and she, she is a bringer of light. I think her um, selecting that name uh, the morning our son was born um, was actually a little piece of her being gifted to Xavian. Wow. Because everywhere she goes, she does just that. Uh, and I think that's why I love her so much because... Oh my God, I'm getting emotional. It's like yeah, 10 seconds good. into your podcast. It's great. Um, <laughs> put tissues under the table. Oh my goodness, because <laughs> she makes everyone a better person. She brings out the best. She focuses on what the, what is the best thing to focus on in a moment and brings her wisdom and her grace into that. Wow. And it's, um, it's one of the most stunning and inspiring things I've ever had the honor of being in presence of. Wow. Um, and she's also an incredible yogi and an incredible teacher. And so she's found, or together, I guess, we've, we've found a way to bring um, what is so special inside her and I think magnify it for people when they need it to find it themselves and to find what they need from it as if it's the signpost that trans, transmutes for everyone to exactly where they need to be guided um, when that time is right for them. It's not for everyone, but when it is right for them, she is, I think, like an, an angelic guide of service. Wow. That's an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you. <laughs> Very sweet. <don't>... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> you don't, like, oh my goodness. I, that's a terrible setup on my end. <laughs> um, well, this is Mark, and he is my husband, my, my soulmate, and exactly how he said, it was the moment we met. I think for me, it was this deep realization that really solidified the idea of past lives and oh, wow. reincarnation. And because the moment we met, it was, wasn't was like, nice to meet you. It was more like, ha, there you are. I found you finally. Mm -hmm. And cool. he is my soulmate, yeah, from the moment we laid eyes on each other and a beautiful partner. And he is a, the most kind-hearted, compassionate, beautiful human being that has gone through a beautiful transformation in his life and has helped me along my path. And everything that he said about me, <laughs> um, <laughs> can't say could have been possible without him by my side because we make a beautiful team together. And everything that we've created with our business, with Boho Beautiful and just our journey and our path has been intertwined together because we've just been holding each other by our sides. Our, we're, we are each other's rock. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him next to me from everything we've gone through. So. Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, awesome. I, I feel like we're giving vows to each other. That's beautiful. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for the you. space to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You don't get an opportunity much in life, I think, to like to speak share? like that. Yeah. To yeah. speak from the heart in a to each other. Yeah. In a way. Everything's always like focused outwards. And I think a lot of the time in partnership you can forget that there's something that holds it together and mm -hmm. to have a space to be able to actually express it is you know it's important i think mm -hmm. it's really important so thank you yeah i agree <laughs> well then one more uh, i was wondering this right whenever uh we were wrapping up that part was parenthood is something new to y'all so yeah. how do you see mark operating as a father like what what's how's uh he's been the most amazing father you know, just to see how he is with Xavian and Xavian Lionheart. Xavian Lionheart. So beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's really beautiful about Mark is the recognition of balance because, you know, we work a lot. We work. Our life is our business and our business is in our life. It's like this weird intertwining condition, which is beautiful. Um, but, you know, for a lot of people, you can get wrapped up in your in your work 
and everything kind of disappears. But for Mark, what he always makes sure is that, you know, if we're going to be leaving Xavier at home with a nanny or my mom, who he is with right now, his grandma, we want to make sure that if we're going to be separating ourselves from our son, that time that we're going to be away from him is going to be used for the most focused, purposeful way possible. And that's something that he truly focuses on and make sure that's the main intention in everything that we do. And I believe that's a, an incredible quality of a father because he recognizes that when he's away, he needs to focus. And when he's home and with Xavier, and he's 100% present with him. And that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the transformation of Juliana going from, from woman into motherhood um, even through the process of the birth was just such a beautiful thing to witness like this warrior inside of her step up to the step up to the the challenge or step into the fire but without any hesitation um, and which again which with such like Juliana like grace um, it actually I think inspired in me the ability to recognize to do the same um, I never knew what having children was actually going to be like. Like I always, I was never really connected to the idea of babies. Like babies to me seemed, I could, couldn't, I'd never even held a baby till our baby. You arrived. know, it's so funny. Well, the like, first thing he said, I remember before we had Xavier, and he was like, you know, when the baby's born, why don't we just give it away for a few years and then pick it back up when he's like four in that cute age? And I was like, no, babe, that's not how it works. So you're like, that's the most precious time. I like the idea of like little kids like running around uh-huh. and being like, babies like freaked yeah, them out. Yeah, exactly, right? But the idea of a baby seems so fragile and innocent. I'm like, that's too much for me. But I think that was sort of came from that like, inability to imagine w- the strength that it would take to to find what it is inside of you and um to be able to nurture like to nurture something that is 100 thousand percent dependent mm. um and that's i think to somebody who has ne- not yet made that step into it can seem almost impossible not impossible to, but uh, in, impossible to see it in yourself and watching her step into that role of motherhood was just sort of like it allowed me to not hesitate. Um, and so to see the grace she handles everything, everything that Xavier asks of her um, so selflessly. And I think, you know, I think a lot of parents, I don't know if it's unique in us. Like, so I don't need, I'm not, I'm trying not to sort of put her on a pedestal to say like, she's the greatest mother in the world. To me, she's the greatest mother in the world. Yeah. You know, but I'm sure every mother that steps into that intention mm-hmm is probably very similar and i think that that's what the journey into parenthood to me has has, she has allowed me to witness to then step in myself because i without seeing that i think i'd be lost i like i'm a father but like i don't know is it is it in my dna i'm not sure but to lead by example in that way has been such a, a beautiful inspiration um Anything, anytime, like what she goes through. Okay. I hear some other husbands say like, what my wife, did? but it's like, it's crazy to see. Like, it's not me that gets woken up to breastfeed in the middle of the night. Mm. It's not me that like, because in this stage in his life, it's all about her. And all I can do is just be like, what can I do to help? Well, the father supports and you okay, do I, a lot. Of course, yeah, of course. In the supportive way. And I think that's what's so wonderful to have that partnership and I give it up to any single mothers out there, you mm, know, who yeah, don't sure. have that support system of a father because you do are having to carry that much more on you, which is, yes, it's difficult, but it's beautiful. You know, it, it's part of this, this transformation into motherhood, but to have an incredible support system with a father and who can take him and, and be there for him, for Xavier as well is it's amazing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you all for sharing all that right up front, yeah. right up top. <laughs> That's great. And Amy, I want you to be included or share anything oh, yeah. that you well, want. Well, just to acknowledge but. what you were saying too, though. I mean, as a mother myself, I have two daughters and like, mm. it's a change for you. But yeah. for a woman, it's a 180. Like your life is mm. not your own anymore, mm-hmm. you know? And mm-hmm. and it really is a true testament to stepping up and you totally. got to take care of yeah. that child. So yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's yeah. a big thing. Mm-hmm. You know, How old so. are your daughters? 17 and 13. Wow. And yeah. I stepped in when they were 11 and <laughs> 15. A whole different phase. <laughs> so yeah. I kind of had the benefit yeah. of what you said. Right. Like, yeah. Hands off and then coming in when they're 11 and 15. Right. And then, Let's go down to the ball yeah. game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, what, you know, whatever. So. Of course, they're teenagers then, so it's all kind of a whole yeah. different. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. But, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, just, just stepping into parenthood, I guess I was curious too, you know, 
it's it's so amazing to have a partner that really sees you as the greatest mother, mm-hmm. right? But um, I'm just wondering if doubt ever creeps into you, and you know, am I doing this right? And what your mind, how you shift your mindset in those moments? Mm. Yeah, I think for me the biggest challenge has been this idea of having to leave Xavier with other people to do my job. I think that's the dif- most difficult part. Even today, like having to like say goodbye to him and so we have a long day and I won't get home until 6, 7 p.m. today. And it's like I'm gone all day away from my son. And so I think for me, that's the biggest challenge to get through. And the way I help myself is making sure that, okay, if I have a full five, six days of you know constant shooting, especially now in Austin, we're super, super busy, then I'm going to find three to four days where I'm just going to completely put everything aside to do with business. I'm going to be with my son and I'm going to like give him all my love, all my attention, because honestly, that's the only thing that matters. Like, of course we're on a mission and there's this great purpose, which is amazing, but Xavier, it takes, goes above that. You know what I mean? He's, he's our son. He's everything to us. And so to me, it's a constant battle of, of yes, feeling sometimes guilty Mm -hmm. for, not being there with him every single day. But, you know, I just try to make sure that when I am with him, I'm there 100%. Mm. And nothing takes me away from that attention and love. And that guilt's like, in a way, I think we tried really hard to turn it into our superpower Mm -hmm. of like how to take that guilt and then instead of be victimed by it, to use it as that motivator to what Juliana was saying, which is Mm. like, now let's make this fucking count. Yeah. Yeah. Like if we're not going to be with him, like this better this better matter yeah. mm. and if it doesn't we're out yeah like mm-hmm. the minute something doesn't matter it's really empowering because now we can say no and it's no yeah. with like conviction it's like mm-hmm. no we're not <laughs> gonna do that today i'd rather be with Xavier. <laughs> mm-hmm. so it's like yeah really trying because i feel like guilt like today closing the door like i went to the car early because i didn't want to be in that process uh. of like is Staying he going to cry? Yeah. Is it this? It, so I was like, I'm going to the car to send text messages. And I literally snuck out to the car because sometimes that guilt is so overwhelming because mm-hmm. I love him so much. Mm-hmm. And so like, but now it's like, okay, let's make this a great fucking podcast. Like, yeah. <laughs> let's have a great time. Yeah. Let's be present. Let's like focus. Mm-hmm. Let's like, well, I don't it, know. It's the purpose of making an impact on other people. And that for yeah. us, it's what drives us. It's like, okay, well, we're going to take time and focus on our job, but at least what we create is going to bring some light and some impact on others that will help them along their journey and so that's the greatest kind of ebb and flow of what we fight with purpose mission and child and family Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's That's impressive to find balance in too because you guys have seem to have a demanding social media presence which means being on a screen yeah in Mm -hmm. some way so that's a tough thing for anybody that's Mm -hmm. building something to oh 100 find balance in you know yeah yeah but support system is yeah and a great team for great the team. business side yeah. too we have really great people around us that honestly especially moving into this new stage of Xavian, mm-hmm. um without the team behind us that it it's impossible social media like the idea of it is such a like it's such a like yeah. demanding force and it's funny because the meter of social media like you get caught so quickly in the comparison and mm. then also all these people that tell you all the rules to social media. Like, you have to post every day or it's never going to work. Mm-hmm. You know, like, it, where I think for us, one of the things that we've helped, that has helped with us is to lean into the idea that we'll use it as an expression more than as a tool for a result. Um, and, and by the expression, when you're trying to force it every day, like we've tried that when people are like, Instagram will never work unless you do this. Um, and it's like this frequency of, of, of content. It's a treadmill. It becomes a mm-hmm. treadmill. And then then what you're putting into it doesn't feel authentic. All of a sudden you're like forcing it. You're like, I have to write something. Like, how is that an expression, right? How is that, how can you connect with someone if you're forcing something? And so I think the social media aspect for us, we've just, we've we've tried really hard to be like, to let our internal being tell us when to do the things. Mm-hmm. And even with like, you know, they say, if you don't post every week on YouTube, you're going to, you know, your algorithm and you're this and you're that. And I think this year we've missed more weeks than ever before being like, you know what? Like, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's totally okay. We can forgive ourselves to like this level of, you know, so the social media criteria. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. So we have a beautiful team that allows us to, to 
express as we need to and understands the idea of like missing stuff is okay so their compassion and their forgiveness and that to us is really beautiful but it's their support i think that allows us to just sort of to let the frequency be what it has to be so that we can have the space to to be a family and to be like to, to, to turn it all off at yeah. a time and be like you know what we're not going to post today and we're just going to like <laughs> go to the park and go for a walk and like <laughs> Be people, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Humans, such like a yoga attitude. Too, right? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you know, like be on your mat and just be in child pose today or whatever. It is. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love it. Well, we'll we're definitely going to get into Boho Beautiful, and for the listeners, you guys have over two million subscribers on YouTube. Is it like two point four, two point five, something like that? Yeah, right, yeah. Something, yeah. something like know. that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> close to half a million on Instagram, something like that. So please go check out Boho Beautiful on mm. YouTube and Instagram, and then you'll find the way to go to their website. Um, mm. And but I do want to get into y'all's stories too. Love to get into the story of how y'all met. We'll get there. <laughs> um, but even before that, like this journey, I want to know both, but I know just a little bit about you, Mark, with your background and um, what what genre would you even say you came up in? Is it punk pop or punk rock or uh, <laughs> um, some 41, right? And then it was Avril Lavigne yeah, too? Yeah, yeah. And what, how, what were your ages then? Some 41 was re- like sev- 16, 16 17? years old? Yeah. Wow. It was, but it was like... It's funny when it comes up because it was a huge part of like learning about conviction um, like and, and standing truth because it was before, it was right at the cusp of the Sum 41 era. Yeah. Um, so it really wasn't anything except, I don't know, five months of like playing in Lions Clubs or Kinsman Halls and basement shows and, you know, smoking pot in the park and like jamming in my mom's basement, you know, like. Then demoing, th- so it was like before they were they were what they were. But it was interesting because I was in Ajax, which ended up being this strange sort of mecca for music for Canada. Um, it's like a little small town outside like, of Toronto. It's just okay, like a, I've heard like, of it. Yeah, so it's yeah. like that's sort of where we were, and they were in the South Ajax, and I was in the North Ajax, and North and South never really intertwined in a way. Um, and I and so my band that I was in at that time. I actually left for some, I mean, it's teenage shit, right? Like, right. you just like, fuck this. Like, these guys, like, I was writing songs about being a vegetarian, and they didn't like that. And then, you know, the drummer said some shit, and then it turned into this thing, and then they heard that that happened. They're like, well, we need a bass player. And so I learned to play bass. I was a guitar player at that time to join them um, and found that, like, it wasn't, it was a very toxic, like, kid kind of thing again and i've always sort of been one about transparency or i felt like a need to always be able to be you know have conversations where you know that what the person and it wasn't right and i ended up leaving at a time when they were about to go like they were like and i left with one of the members because it was just a really toxic environment for us yeah and we started our own band which started us on a whole different trajectory of like more of a music with meaning because we felt like there was something more to art yeah and they felt that art was just about you know, getting wasted and hit, you know, pranking people and doing stuff. And it turned into this really weird feud, actually. Like there was this, it, it diverged into like, they wrote a bunch of songs on their first record about me and the guy that left. And like, we're like in the liner notes and like, <laughs> oh, wow. they used to terrorize us on message boards and stuff. Cause they're like, kind of bullying. They, yeah, yeah. We got yeah. bullied hard. Yeah. Like Through it music. was like, but yeah. like on a level yeah. where at that point, like to have a band out of obscurity that you were just in launched to like, ultimate success yeah. and then spit on you from there it was like oh man it's a fucking like monster it's a mind warp, warp yeah but it allowed us to find a, a space to be like well what we're doing means something fight for the forgotten.org you can go check out fight for the forgotten the foundation that i started it is my passion project it is something that i love so much because of the people we get to help we get to help the pygmy tribe who adopted me in help themselves. We say opportunity is greater than charity. Charity can be great, but opportunity is just always better. That's why we've drilled something like 80 water wells already, providing over 30,000 people clean water. We've started sustainable farms, bought back over 3,000 acres of land for the people who originally owned it, put it in their name. We built 32 homes, and now we're about to start a health center, a school, and a marketplace. They're going to have a maternity ward, a pediatrics unit, 
and a dental suite. You can join the Fight for the Forgotten Fight Club at fightfortheforgotten.org. We would love, love, love to invite you on this journey to join this fight arm in arm with us. Our fight club, it's a monthly giving club. You can give $5 or more a month, and that empowers us to empower people. Thank you for being on this journey with us. I invite you to come along for the ride. It's been absolutely epic, putting love and compassion in action and fighting for people. Fightfortheforgotten.org, join our fight club. And so we kept writing songs from the heart about like higher ideas. We were like a political punk band, like trying to open a consciousness inside music. You know, like there's like bands like Propagandy and like there's a lot of really great punk bands that we listened to at the time. And so then we just took it upon ourselves to be the creators of our own universe. And that was in a way sort of the first step of being like, well, if that path over there seems really toxic and gross and filled with people like that, maybe we can create our own world on this side. Mm -hmm. And it's something we carried through. Like all of this, it all kind of connects to what happened Mm -hmm. in our world. Yeah. Because then we like booked our own tours. Like we went on, like in my mom's minivan, like driving around North America, like, you know, 18 year old kids dropping out of high school to just like literally do punk rock tours. And like, so then I started my own label. Sounds pretty punk rock. Yeah, it was, it totally was. So I started like making cassettes. Like I figured out how to make cassette tapes at a manufacturing plant and like signed all these local bands and like set them up in local record shops all over like Canada, like would talk to the owners. I was like an 18 year old kid, like trying to figure it all out and being like, if it's been done, then it can be figured out how to do it. So it actually, they were kind of a catalyst in their bullying and they're like literally like, like they would like, egg my house or like call my parents in the middle of the night like with voice disguisers and be like torture us like at like three in the morning like just crazy Mm. shit like like just i remember it so i I haven't actually talked about this in 25 years which is really interesting but it was like it was really hard yeah and but i you know i think through all of the struggle figuring out that being like well if that's that then what can we be was Mm. the question and it just i don't know that sort of helped us to like to start my punk rock journey and like, so the question you started with was where, what, it was all punk rock. And, yeah. but I always felt a need to explore. Like if an opportunity in life comes, it's really hard to say yes or no, or to judge it for what it's worth until you experience it. So later when their manager, who I would like this guy, this sort of music mogul guy that was in a very renowned band in Canada called Treble Charger, he, I had introduced them at a show because he always wanted my old band to open up. He was the one that got them the deal um, to get them to where they were. But he came back around to me and was like, hey man, do you want to try out for this girl in New York? And I was like running a recording studio and my label and all this stuff in Toronto. And it was this really weird moment of like, what? Like I'm a punk rock guy. But he's like, oh, it'd be really cool. You'll get a paycheck if you get the job. You know, she's all lined up, ready to rock. Like, it's going to be the biggest thing in the world. And I had actually just watched this movie with Mark Wahlberg called Rockstar. <laughs> and he had an experience like that. And I'm not even kidding when the credits of that movie were on, because all I was doing was like drinking green tea and smoking cigarettes and watching rental VHS cassettes at that time <laughs> in my life, because I was just working at a studio. So afterwards, what do you do? You go home and I, like the credits were rolling and I and the phone rang and it was him saying that. And I was like, I guess I have to go check this out. And that was sort of the beginning of going into like the mainstream side of things. Cause I went and I got the job and I was like, I went to explore it. I was like, well, I can't say no. And then when I was there, she was a really sweet girl and she needed a lot of support and there weren't a lot of good people around her. So I was like, well, I'll take the job. I, but I didn't believe it was going to be what it was. It's like, you know, I get, I think they paid us like 500 bucks a week. Like it was like nothing at the start. Like, and I was like, to live in New York and LA, that'll be fun. Like it was more about an experience and sort of, again, exploring the world. Like, you know, I'd seen it from a van and now I'm like, oh, I can see it from, you know, living in this cool apartment in Manhattan. Like I'm from Ajax, like who's ever going to get to say they do that? So it was like about testing those waters. And, and then that's opened up a whole different world of shit. Cause Avril, like within a few months, like was like the lights turned on and it was like, we were the biggest thing in the world all of a sudden, or she was, but like they had actually one of the parts that really made us feel terrible about it was they positioned us like we were a band at the beginning. So all of a sudden we're like, but we're not a band. I'm just a bass player. And then they, I, it got, it got a little strange at that point, but it was also strange because we were catapulted into this world of just like, like I was literally went from living in a van in like a basement apartment in Toronto to being like at the Grammys or whatever. 
Like you're just like, what the fuck? Like it was like so total matrix glitch. But again, like learning a lot as I went and also learning a lot about myself. And I don't know. So that was like the pop side of everything I did was just sort of a weird social experiment for me to see, I guess, if I could hold on to who I was in that circus. And the minute I felt like I was failing at that because fame is a drug and it's a very strong mm. drug on that level. And I watched her change and I got my, like my best friend, I brought him into the band. He became the guitar player and I watched him start to change and like everyone started to buy in. And I was like, I felt myself buying in and I was like, fuck, I got to get out of this. Like I'd spent too long in the van to just be like, this is who I am. Like people telling you who you are isn't who you are. There's like a, there's a truth inside. And so, yeah, I mean, that was the beginning of that. And I ended up quitting and going back on tour in my van. <laughs> I was like, fuck it. I went and moved into my mom's basement after all that and just like picked up my record label again and then started in that journey. Like being like yeah. a little. But it's crazy just to add to the story what Mark is saying is for him to quit, what he did was like he just kind of says it, but like he walked away from something that people would label success. Yeah. Fame, money, like all the coolest parties, all these famous people, like people from the outside world be like, how could you just say no and walk away and go move into your mother's basement and sleep on a mattress? Well, like what, you know what I mean? It was yeah. a total glitch for regular people to understand why somebody would actually walk away from something like that. But you did you know, because it, was, it wasn't feeling in your heart. Well, I moved on the basement as punishment for myself. <laughs> Oh. It, well, I knew that if I was going to give up what everyone said was the greatest thing in the world, that I had to put myself at the lowest point that I could ever be to earn the right to like, to build a new life. Like I needed a life to replace it. And I wasn't just going to go like work at McDonald's or something. So that's when I like, I was like, my mom was like, your room's upstairs. I was like, no, I'm living in the basement. And I put a mattress on the floor and a computer next to my thing and a, my, next to the mattress on a desk. And I said, I'm going to start my label. And every day I just worked on my label. Because, you know, to give something like that up, I recognized what it was and it was very difficult to psychologically cope with it. And it was like, you, it was, yeah, I guess maybe I do breeze over it, but like, you know, I would just like cry like all the time it just because yeah. I, it felt so wrong to be in that position in life. But everyone- you cry while you were- there at the, no, the top or once you left? No, well, I was at the top. Yeah. Like, cause not in the moment, but yeah. I come back to Ajax, like on t a, a down week. And I just be like, what am I like? This isn't me. Like, it was like this, like thing in me was just like yelling, like you're not where you're supposed to be mm. like, like every night. And like, who could I talk to about that? Everyone's like, you know, you're on the big, you know, you're in YM magazine on the cover of whatever. And all the things, you know, all the stuff that feels like it's supposed to fill you up. But it just, you know, made me feel more empty. So like I got into drugs, like hard to cover it all up, quiet the voice. Maybe the voice will go away if I quiet the voice. Maybe if I associate with more famous people, you know, go to that party tonight and force it in and like go to that bar and have extra this and extra yeah. that and subs and all the stuff. And you're just like, you're at this pinnacle optically. But, and then the more I think I would put shit in my system, obviously the more I would feel empty and, and mm. so much internal energy just like, and then you go home and you're just like sitting in Ajax, like back where you grew up. And you're like, fuck, this doesn't, like I, I, I came from this, the van, like the punk rock. Like that's where the heart is, like where music meant something. Now I'm playing someone else's songs, pretending they're mine, you know, pretending that we're a band, like pretending this is real. Like, and at that point that it was like a big ruse, like they positioned us, like we were like this thing that we weren't. And it just felt weird. It was just mm -hmm. like, you know, and I think that there's, so it's it's a weird story because it's hard for me to even relate to it at this point. But I think that the, the truth or the thread that's in it is like in anything in life you're not doing when that feeling is there, whether it's optically like whatever I was going through or whether it's just your job or whether it's just like where you're putting your energy or relationships that aren't feeding you and they feel wrong, but you keep doing it. That that voice, that, 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 th that, that thing, that energy, it's, you, we have to learn to listen to it mm. because that's where your true path. I like everyone has mm. a truth and a path that they should be going towards because it's the most comfortable place for them to be. And so through that uncomfort, you learn what's wrong for you, but it's the act of changing it that I think if there's anything that people should take from a story like that, which is hard, I'd imagine to associate to, but it's like act like make the decision, 
no matter how hard it might seem, because on the other side of that decision, you'll land on your feet and you'll be better off. Mm. Um, and I, I don't know. And I, it's beautiful. I, I have a similar story. I can just kind of relate N- not on your level of success or fame, but I remember getting my hand raised and feeling empty, mm-hmm. getting my hand raised, putting in this many weeks or this many months of training for this one fight, four months, you know, uh, with the date circling the calendar, two or three fights a year, that's it. And there, there was years that went by where I'm getting my hand raised, getting my hand raised, getting my hand raised. And I would have a voice in my head be like, is this it? Hmm. Is this all? And so then I went to the drugs and all this other stuff. But after I got to be on your podcast and, and share the vision story, I left fighting on a winning streak and agents didn't understand promoters didn't understand fans <laughs> didn't understand. But what kind of probably initially hurt at the most was, was my dad didn't understand. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. There was a moment where he said, and he's not doing well now, so this isn't for shame or anything like that, but I just remember him saying, uh, you're a waste of talent. And uh, so that like hit wow. me. But then once I was there and he said something similar to that when I came back, I was like, I just remember I was being interviewed once and, and I was kind of acting like I was saying it to my dad. Um, and they said, why would you do that? And I was like, if you just got to be here, experience what I'm getting to experience, see what I'm getting to see. And yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's difficult, but these people are amazing Mm -hmm. and they're awesome Mm -hmm. and I love them. And I'm getting chills just even saying that because it was like, I knew I wasn't supposed to be there doing what I was doing and fighting at that time, Mm -hmm. like win or lose, have an excuse to use. But then whenever I found this calling, this purpose, this truth inside, like everything changed, light bulbs came on and that's whenever my spirit came alive. Wow. Like it, it set me on fire. And it's, so That's crazy because I don't think about the Avril time for me very much. At yeah. All. So having it present right now in this t- and rehearing that, I like, I relate very deeply because that, and again, I was a bass player. I wasn't Avril. Like I get, like it wasn't the, the highest pinnacle. Like if I was Avril, I may have never came back. Um, mm. But so to know that you were the one, I think it's actually at a probably at a harder position to to, yeah. to listen to that voice because it was your hand being raised. I got the awards and the things and the whatever, but it was her. Like it was her, and I don't want to make it seem like it was me at all. But for you, like, and so what do you think that is? Like, you think it's the lack of purpose? Because now you, wait, it's interesting. You say now I fight with a purpose, right? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And so, and now I fight with a purpose. Yeah. Like we have a purpose in life, and so right. is that the absence of purpose in success? Or um, I think I think for me it was. I don't know if I saw it as selfish or just as empty, but it just wasn't what set my soul on fire. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, I was putting my body through actual punishment. Um, and I was going in there and at the time, because I was fueled by not thinking out of it as a sport, like it is, I was thinking of it as a fight. I'm having to prove that I'm mm-hmm. not that kid anymore being bullied and it's a fight. I'm coming to punish you. Wow. and like get out my anger or my aggression or whatever. And then after I do that and it wins successfully, it's like, oh, this some reason doesn't, it doesn't feel rewarding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you this because there would be times that cheers or applause is going on. I remember one fight, like people were like kind of chanting my name and I'm getting my hand raised. I'm thinking like, ah, afterwards go to the after party, people coming up, taking pictures or shaking hands and, Um, and I just remember in that moment feeling like why, and it was, it probably said in even more, I wasn't comfortable there, but whenever I went back to the hotel room and I had, was all alone, had a handle of liquor drinking, I just remember thinking, how could I feel so alone? Like, how could I feel so alone around all those people? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that where you just feel like not understood or not. Like they see me, but they don't like, this isn't, this is, this is maybe a facade or, or whatever. It's not like, you don't like me because of who I am. You like me because of what I do type thing or, and am I feeding that animal too? It's like you've created an avatar of yourself and mm. people are like honoring this avatar, but they don't actually know who you are in your heart. Mm. Who Really Justin is. And so it feels, uh, that's just my projection on it, but it seems like it feels fake because they're cheering just a perception of who you, who they think you are. Hmm. Maybe that doesn't fill you up in that way. And for yeah. them to celebrate an accomplishment that yeah. you can't celebrate. Hmm. Like that, yeah. I think 
I understand that for sure. Mm-hmm. I just think there was a calling of there's something more, just like of you. Course. Mm-hmm. Well, there's there's something more. There's something yeah. more, and you guys have found that something more. Mm-hmm. Like, what was that journey like in your journey? And when did how long were you there? And when did y'all meet? I know it's been ten years, but were you out of it yet? Or yeah, I was after I left Avril. Um, I went back to the basement and yeah. climbed this weird music ladder to where the label like. And I've learned, and I think there's something to be said about when you focus on something every day, like it's a thing that you like, it's your, your source of every ounce. Um, and whether it's myself or anyone around me and in music, you see it quite often. It's a thing that like you rise to what you find like manifestation. I, I like, if you truly believe in anything and you dedicate your entire being to it, I think anything is possible. And I think that was one of the things I saw myself take an, like an idea in a basement and become one of the biggest punk labels in Canada and then sign a deal with Universal and then mm. Universal liked our bands and then they wanted to sign our bands and then I ended up in this, again, reactionary ping pong ball machine where all of a sudden I was like doing something like in, with Avril, I never really wanted to be a pop star ever and now all of a sudden I was a record executive and I was like, and like it was really weird because again, turned back like with Avril to drugs and to things and all the, like went through the same repeat thing and thank god at a weird pinnacle for canada it's a very shallow pond in canada like it's a lot less you can fit all of canada in california you know what i mean so to to be a, a predominant record executive in that for what it's worth like i i don't know i kind of look at it i was like well i just worked really fucking hard and like you know i signed some really great bands like it was the bands like i didn't do a lot but she found me while i was again in this spiraled well, we found each other when I was in this sort of spiraled state of like, like empty, like even almost worse than Avril, like being like sitting in a boardroom, like with the three other executives of the company, like each of us have a department of, you know, the and they're twice my age, you know, I, at this point I was like 30. Like, I don't know what, like my boss was like the CEO, like he was, he was my boss, like <laughs> putting a 30, accelerating that quickly and then being like, and this is your future. I mean, like, this is, I'm going to be you guys. And like, they're g- good guys, but like, yeah. came from a van. Like, I lived, <laughs> like, I was a punk rock guy. You know what I mean? And so anyways, like, again, like, just didn't know how to behave or how to react or how to cope and tried everything to fill the, the stop the voice and to just like, to be like, no, maybe if I get a fancy car, that'll make me feel better. And no, if I do enough drugs or no, if I do this or do that. Um, and then one day, um, because it was Canada and there, the West Coast of Canada was always kind of neglected musically. There's so much talent in Vancouver, but because Toronto has a complex and thinks it's the center of the universe, rarely ever like goes to like work with talent on the West Coast. And so, you know, I took over the A&R department. And I was like, we're going to set ourselves up in Vancouver. There's so many amazing people out there that are making beautiful music and like incredible stuff. So we started setting up little like trips where we go and live there for a while and like immerse in the communities and the scenes and like see what's happening in the hip hop area of, the, of what's happening and see what's happening in the pop and like really like get our, get our, get ourselves in. And we heard about this gir- this group, actually, we heard about a group and it was, <laughs> it was a hip hop like meets pop kind of gangsta street dance group. And gangsta. I was well, Cat brought the gangsta, <laughs> and I was like, "That's like, cause I was really, I'm really attracted to things I've never heard, like, <laughs> like Skrillex. Like when I heard Skrillex yeah, for the first time, I was I like, that. I've never heard this, like a sound you've never heard. So I heard about this thing, and I was like, I gotta check this out, and um, and it was her thing. Really, I was in the group. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was a singer and a dancer. Um, it's funny how I came to that because I, I started my, I started as a gymnast from the age of seven, like back in Ukraine too, which was like different, it trained us to be like soldiers. Were you born in Ukraine? I was born in Russia actually. Okay. Yeah, but I was raised in Ukraine until I was 10. And I moved to Canada with my family when I was 10 years old. And so I took something that I already started and beaten to be a gymnast I took it into Canada and so my whole childhood I was a professional rhythmic gymnast um pretty much took over my whole life I was went to a special school I only went to school for four hours a day trained eight hours a day was training for um the Beijing 2008 Olympic Games I was on the Olympic development team was what they called us and um because of the I don't know if you know what rhythmic gymnastics is it's like 
the one with the ribbons yeah. and yes, the balls? Yes, yeah, okay. Absolutely. It's the precision. <laughs> it's, it's the one where you yeah. like contort it's, yourself and bend yeah, yourself in yeah. half. That's what I did. <laughs> you could be in Cirque du Soleil. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah. a lot of gymnasts when they retire, yeah. they get taken to Cirque du Soleil. But um, I ended up by the end of my, I was around sixteen. I ended up having like five hairline fractures in my spine. Whoa! Um, it was terrible. How I, old? Sixteen. Sixteen years old. Yeah, I I went through crazy experience where i had to go to every hospital and every doctor in, in vancouver bc at that time and they would even take like my mris and they say well you're 16 but your mris are showing a spine of a 60 year old woman Whoa. it was very similar and i was in a lot of pain <laughs> had mm. to be on like crazy you know drugs to even get through competitions and um i had to be in that stage of pain and still training at that level because in Canada, I don't know if they have the same in America, but they have this thing called like your carded athlete, meaning the government pays you mm. X amount of money to represent the country. And so you're sent out to all these competitions worldwide to represent the country. Yeah. I and, had something like that. It was called the BJ Stupak Fund, but okay. we would get money, but we had to compete and we had to show up and we had right. to do certain things. So you had like these assignments mm -hmm. you had to do, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's a similar thing. I think just a different name, but um and because at that time with my family immigrating from Ukraine, we were very, very poor. And I was pretty much like like taking care of my whole family, like the my parents. Money. Yeah, my parents yeah. were taking the money that I would make every month from the government and we were supporting our family. Her, and so her, her dad's really interesting because he was a doctor mm -hmm. in Ukraine and then he came to Canada and he had to go through years of Re Canadian yeah. standards. Right. So he was like, a doctor delivering pizzas and driving yeah. limousines. Yeah, and going to school. And going, and to, going school. to school. Yeah. Wow. And making it through, like, and Canada's pretty intense with that kind of, yeah. well, like, what he, he's still working, like, he's still getting, te like, this is like 10, 15 he's years He's a later. working doctor now, but he's no, but, like, still he's, having he's to still do all these, these tests yeah, and stuff. Yeah. Like, right. So it's a standard, but it was, like, crazy to imagine that the sacrifice he was making. Yeah. But then the onus that put on Julianne, like, I always look at that story and it's, like, it's a breathtaking story. Yeah. Like to, well, we, it was quite humbling because it's like we started our life like we took food from food banks and got our furniture from dumpsters. You know what I mean? Like it was like we were really at the bottom. And so for me at that time, I was making $3,000 a month being an athlete. Like that was more than both of my parents could make. And so when it came to the time where I was severely injured and in severe pain every day, um, my dad actually, who was a nurse at the time, at the end of my career, he would be taking morphine from his job so he could give me a little bit so I could get through some competitions because it was that severe. Um, but I couldn't quit my gymnastics career because I knew I had to support my family. It wasn't until the very end where there was a moment actually, I remember I collapsed on the bathroom floor because I stopped feeling my legs. Mm. There was some, something happened in the nerves of my spine and they took me to the emergency and they were like, listen, like if you continue to train and I know you want to get to this, you know, Olympic development team, that means it was going to be two years. It was right before, you know, 2008. Um, if you continue at this pace and at this level, like there's a chance you might be in the wheelchair for the rest of your life. And it was at that moment where I was like, well, and my parents too, they're like, this isn't worth the risk anymore. And so I quit. I retired as a gymnast because of these injuries. Were you 16? I was 17, 17? at that time. Yeah. Um, you know, I had to walk away from a lot of well, these. Can, you were like, she was winning Pan Am games and yeah. the Pacific, like, like she was the one. Like, not because I know you wouldn't say that. I just like, I think that's really interesting because to like, to step away from that. Like, and that was more less of a stepping away from the life, but also because of, I just couldn't continue with the injuries and the pain yeah, that yeah, I yeah. was having to suffer through. For sure, and I I can't imagine. I mean, I, I being from wrestling and fighting, like mm -hmm. it's it's strenuous, but to see the peak of how young um, yeah. gymnasts are and how much they put themselves through, and fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen year olds at the Olympics or training mm -hmm. for the Olympics, and it's just it's it's something else. Do you? This is a side note, but do you think some of gymnast stunts uh, or their growth is stunted because oh, of yeah. a lot of the, I mean, there's a lot of, I remember being at the Olympic Training yeah, Center yeah, and how totally. short they were and small oh, they yeah. were. And it's just like you were yeah. bending at these early age where you're probably like doing stuff to mm. your Or even your just growth like plates. the physical demands yeah. of the sport and the training. Like I was 16, I looked like a 12 year old boy at that point. Like I didn't even hit puberty. You know what I mean? Like it's, it reflected everywhere. 
inside and yeah. out, you know? So for sure. But he, then like you go through a big growth spurt once you stop. Yeah. yeah you always see the Olympic Olympians, like yeah. the gymnasts. And it's astounding how short and how young they all look. And I've always wondered that too. Yeah. Like it has to be something about yeah. training. Well, it sounds different when a wrestler stops cutting weight and they're, they retire. Mm -hmm. They either get into coaching and they stay fit or they just balloon up because they're not <laughs> coaching right. anymore. So they grow outward. But you yeah. say that gymnasts grow tall. Uh, some, afterwards, yeah, some of them, yeah. Some, yeah. Did you grow um, after? Did, oh, yeah. I like mean, no tall because. No, maybe oh. not the tall. I'm not very <laughs> tall. That's just kind of how my family is, though. But I definitely, like, I finally, my body caught up in the puberty <laughs> way. Uh, finally started to look more as a female, as a woman, than I did, you know, at 16. Yeah. But, um, uh, well, how, how, <clears throat> so the podcast is called Overcome, and we basically talk about how to, how to win this fight called life and overcome mm. some of life's greatest challenges. But that sounds like such a huge weight and pressure mm -hmm. to be put on, to be put on anyone and the pressures your family had yeah. even just coming to Canada and all the weight. I mean, the struggle probably from the father and mother putting that on you. I mean, surely they're internally conflicted, but mm -hmm. just that dynamic of how did you, overcome that or move through that or what was that process like to where now you're retiring mm -hmm. before you get the opportunity to go to Beijing mm -hmm. and you're stepping away from it for your literal physical health yeah. longevity mm -hmm. 60 year old spine and a 16 year old's body or 17 year old's body mm -hmm. yeah I and mean, that's a that's a lot to process it is a lot to process and I you know when I stepped away and finally, you know, they cut the contract, I was fully relieved from my duties as a gymnast to the Canadian government. Um, I hit a really, really dark, low mm. moment in my life. I was so lost because everything I've known my whole life since the age of seven was gymnastics. That's all I did. I didn't have a social life. I was bullied in school mm. because I would never fit in with any of the kids. I was the girl that ghosted at 11 a.m., and went away and trained and especially also in the school that I went they had this special program for like the this called sports which is sport and arts program and I was kind of put in this group with other kids that were athletes that came all over the country and, and come to the school but at the same time there's also regular school they kind of intertwined and so the regular kids um, didn't understand us and people that were really dedicated in that form of sport or arts so the bullying was really difficult um, through the whole journey. But then after I quit, um, I didn't have that sport or that training to escape to. I was kind of, I still had to finish high school. I still had a great 11 and 12 at that time mm. to go through. Um, so I became really lonely and depressed and just really lost in life. And, um, the one thing that I started to really focus on to kind of help me get through that dark point is my recovery because I was in pain still and I still had to like, I had to bring my health back to myself and I had a lot of damage to heal and to fix. Um, and so I turned to dance, which was something that I enjoyed, ballet, which was very strict, but that helped to realign my body and other kinds of forms of dance as well because I just wanted to have fun and find another escape and to overcome the feeling of feeling completely lost and alone because that's how I felt as well. I didn't have any support team outside of my family. I didn't have a lot of friends, all of those things. I was just like, wow, okay, what do I do now with my life? I don't know what to do. Um, and so the dancing and the ballet and even different kinds of rehab like Pilates and that's kind of when I started bringing yoga into my life was my first way of finding that reconnection and healing through with my body through a different way. And that's kind of how it actually all ties into the whole way I met Mark is because. <laughs> and how old were you here about? Uh, well, I started, started yoga like 17, 18. Okay, yeah. Great. So, I mean, that was before I met Mark, but that was the transition into that, the dance world <laughs> for me. And it was really fun. And I just, you know, I still had a lot of my gymnastics that I brought in. I had the flexibility and like so much training. So it really helped me excel in, in, in the dancing part. But I lost myself in that form of art and I loved it. And I had a great time. I did some stuff with like TV and film and that was something that I really focused on between yeah the ages of 18 and 21 
And because I did a lot of like backup dancing for artists and movies, same way, I always kind of felt empty because I was always supporting somebody else's journey. And at the time I had two friends and we all were all dancers. And we're like, you know what? Let's just start our own like singing, dancing band. You know, let's just like create something and finally be doing something for ourselves rather than always supporting another person's art or career. And that's kind of how we started this girl group. I guess. Yeah, I like how you call it a singing, dancing band. Well, <laughs> I guess you call it a girl group. Yes. But we, the two of us sang. So I sang. That's another thing I'd love to do. I'd love to sing, but I was always timid to do it. And that kind of forced me to come She's forward in that. a singer, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> and um, my other, so the two of us sang and then I had another friend of ours who was a rapper. And so wow. we sang and rapped and it was very like hip hop. We had a friend of ours that came and lived in our living room at the time because we all decided to share an apartment together. And he produced in exchange for rent <laughs> to stay in our house, <laughs> our first couple of songs. And you we probably liked that. Gig. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, yeah. And because of that, we took those songs and we just decided to start booking these random gigs in different venues and restaurants and clubs and bars all over Vancouver and just had fun with it. And I guess that's kind of how the word spread about our girl group. And Mark came. To what was Vancouver. it called? It was called Vanity. Okay. Vanity, nice. <laughs> yeah, it was very vain. But it was, you know, <laughs> no. all about <laughs> dancing. And, <laughs> That's great. Uh, Amy was in a, a girl band too, and then really? she went out on her own, and yeah, she's we, got like we five like, albums. You know, like, like, a, a, like rock, a real, yeah. like a a real band right? yeah. <laughs> with musical instruments. But I'm not opposed to the girl band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. So did you do any dancing? Uh... We had one instance where we did some coordinated moves and uh -huh. outfits. Yeah, okay. it was very different when was you're like the 38 Playboy and doing it. Was that, huh? <laughs> was that at the Playboy Mansion? It was not. No, okay. was not. Did you sing yeah. and, and, did. and play an instrument? I did. Yeah, yeah. what did you play? Guitar. Guitar. Guitar? Yeah. Wow. And what were you guys called? We were called the cover girls then, oh. we were doing, um, yeah, just cover songs. But then we started to become an original band and wow. then things fell apart. But yeah, as they do. As as they exactly. That's yeah. funny because that's what the same thing happened to, yeah. to this girl group that I was in. Um, is when we met Mark, he came down uh, to see one of our shows. and Well, before the shows, didn't I? I don't know. I saw the show and then we met the next Yeah, day. and then we met at this. Who were you opening for? It was like. Nelly. <laughs> Nelly. Like, okay, that's for... amazing. Oh, Nelly. I mean, Nelly. That's awesome. Right? Yeah. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> yes. I remember yeah. going with Ivan, actually. <laughs> Just being like, because it was really over the top and ver like the outfits they wore yeah. and just like the routines was just like, I'd never been in the girl group area. But Again, you know, it's funny. It's when I look back at it because of what you, the, your story, just and how <laughs> the fighting was your way to like fight back and get mm. back at all the bullying and like yeah. the feeling this alone and it's isolated in your life. I find that this girl group somehow was my way to get on stage and wear oh, these crazy outfits and just be in the center of attention in a different way. Over it's like oh, sexual as well because it was sexy stuff, right? It was almost like my coping way mm. to face that feeling that I felt my whole life of being, you know, made fun of and the girl that looked like a boy and like just like really undesired and like made to feel worthless mm. outside of gymnastics, you know? And so it's interesting, like when you psychoanalyze yeah, the feeling really of what I actually felt and why I was even pulled to be in like this kind of girl group. It way away kind of how when you got on that fighting rank, you were fighting because you had something to prove mm -hmm. that you were strong and that they couldn't make you feel this way. For me, fierce. like, yeah, it when I really, get on really the stage, fierce. like, I just needed to prove that, like, yeah, I can do something different and, and cool, you know, labeled by mainstream society of yeah. being in a girl group. Um, so I think that was an outlet for me to get that energy out and to feel like bring my confidence back to myself again and as a woman. And it did help in that way. I really felt like I came into my strength mm. in a funny way that it was through a girl group. I think it's, <clears throat> it was like, it was so fierce. And I, mm. that's what's like interesting about genres of music <clears throat> and the art of it. And I think like the most amazing thing about artists expressing themselves is when they doesn't, to me, I think, it, the container you put it in, like the genre, never mattered once I started to understand like the energy exchange. And when someone's authenticity or that fire or that force or whatever it might be, 
they find a container, whether it's like a girl group or a punk band or a metal band or a, a hip hop act or whatever it is, when the, it, when the expression is so pure and you, you can see it as mm. like a deeper thing than, oh, I'm doing this to get to something. It's like, no, I'm doing this for the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, that's what I've always been really attracted to. And anything I've ever worked in the, with music that's had that, and Avril had that, which is funny. And that's why, why I ended up doing it, because I saw that in her. That's the thing I'm always really attracted to, is that authentic like, energy. Like, it's all just communication. And, but it's amazing to take instruments and a stage and like all kinds of things and figure out a creative way of communicating whatever that energy is. And what's so funny is I remember at that Nelly show at like some <laughs> arena and like standing at the back with like my guy, like this guy, Ivan, and he's like, really, he was like the hip hop guy. Like, so I felt safe at an LA show with him, <laughs> as weird as that sounds. And being like watching these girls do it and just being like, it was so weird to me, but there was this like, this thing, this fire. And now I like, I haven't really thought about this before, but seeing that in Juliana and those girls was just like, it was like, Oh, there's some underneath all the outfits and the things and whatever. I was like, there's this thing there. And maybe that's what that, like, well, I've never heard you express it mm -hmm. like that, but to think about that, I was like, that's what that was. Yeah. And I was like, that's cool. And that's why we're like, we need to sit down with them for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> nice. that was like the thing, right? Yeah, that's kind of, well, that's how, what brought Mark and I together. But it's funny when we met each other, like we were saying in the beginning, we had this instant connection. Um, we continued to be in a working relationship because Universal decided they wanted to sign our band into a record label. Mm -hmm. And um, Mark and I, instantly fell in love with each other and we knew how wrong it would look from the outside and oh a manager a record label guy is dating the the singer it's like obviously you know it's like the cliche oh it's so it's thing so cliche that people it like make i was fun like of. i'm doing this yeah like it was like so it we was actually painful. ended up keeping our relationship I'm very secret yeah. yeah it was very secret well, i would like come and, and visit him in toronto put on hats and like hide because we were so scared for people to see us together but we like we truly fell in love like the, outside of everything that we were doing we, that like, lunch like the next day like we i was meeting them at a noodle shop mm -hmm. in downtown on Burrard street and there's a little noodley shop like whatever we're like let's just meet them and you know see what they're like as people and i remember walking in you were the only one there and it, and it was you were wearing this like lakers hat and which she's never watched basketball in her life, just to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a Kobe fan. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a hat. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember walking in and just stopping. And like she looked and, and she just stopped. And there was this thing. And that was this, this moment. And within like 24 hours of that, we were like off on our own riding bikes in the park. Like it was so mm -hmm. weird. It was like, I don't know how it happened. Like maybe yeah. we all went out that night. And I remember we were like, like, you want to get together tomorrow? And it was like, not to anything more than just like, let's go rent some bikes mm -hmm. and go to like bikes. I'm like record label guy. It was <laughs> so, it's so like, but there's this like impulse to do and behave a certain way. And when it, and everything was telling both of us, probably everything's telling us like, this is not what you, how you should be behaving in the constructs of this relationship. But none of that fucking mattered. Like, yeah. and we, the more we pursued it, the deeper we connected. Yeah. And the deeper we connected, everything else on the other side just seemed so stupid. Like, yeah. like all of it. And that whole voice, like, telling me I was in the wrong place was just, like, reaffirmed mm -hmm. by, like, by her support yeah. and her love. And everything escalated very quickly for us after that. Like, um, the girl group I was in, we all moved to Toronto, which was the other, across the country. And... I which think, is where you were. Yeah, which yeah, is where yeah. Mark lived. She I, moved into my place. I literally immediately moved oh, nice. in with Mark secretly. <laughs> I was like, living in his house. <laughs> Um, secretly <laughs> but uh the one thing i think that made us really realize is once people feel like oh we got this record label and this whole thing illusion like oh you're gonna be a big oh, band yeah. it got into the other girl one is one girl especially her head and the ego took over where everything wasn't about perfecting your art or focusing even harder now to work harder to create music to create this art that we want to to create the passion that we had it all turned into the parties you wanted to get into and like the other side and it started to build this toxicity and in, in, in the dynamic of the group 
It was and it's very very toxic. It's funny. There's yeah. a like a, with artists that get the deal. You know, there's this thing that's like, oh, I made it. Like again, mm -hmm. taking away the process and feeling like the result that they've worked so hard for has now been achieved. When actually, when you get the deal, the work should double. Like yeah. the focus that's should intensify. Where it begins. Yeah, exactly. like that's the yeah. start. Yeah. But we live in this society of like record deal. Well, I don't know if it's that way anymore. But like back then, it was like a record deal is the the pristine moment of success. It's like, but it is. It's the starting. And so, and we had set it up at Universal at that point. Like I was in L.A. working with this guy Martin Kirzenbaum, who was like Lady Gaga's guy. He was right under Jimmy Iovine. Jimmy Iovine was taking a liking to the dem like the one song we had done with them. And so it was like lining up in this way where like all these artists now, like when they came to Toronto, they all wanted to meet them. So the girls in the group, like the one especially, like she's like, I made it. She's like immediately, like these, they were the most dedicated. The, honestly, like the, you guys were so dedicated. Like you were doing like training all day, every day when they came to Toronto. Like I remember Ivan went and got you guys like a, like a rap game. Like, so mm. ca like just to like, just to keep the craft going. Like, so they were like rapping video games and like doing like everything, like dancing all day, like singing lessons, like at my apartment like just like recording and recording mm -hmm. and recording and recording and it was like this beautiful thing and the minute that the thing started to come together like the girl like it was just like a powder keg the ego like, became the ego too overpowered in, right? like and, oh yeah. we worked so hard and now we got and so it was like so it exploded yeah. and everything just fell apart at that point and we had to disband before anything even happened like um, all lined up yeah. it was yeah, really crazy we just actually. walked away yeah. and it felt right though in the heart. It was like this. Just, mm. I couldn't imagine living in that kind of toxicity. For yeah, well, years. powder keg in another kind of way too, with like y'all's love exploding and and, and y'all yeah. both feeling like you're maybe in the wrong place, yeah. but actually, yeah, perfectly exactly. in the right place, so that y'all can be doing what you're doing now. Yeah. yeah, and I'm excited to to dive into that because uh, before we close, I, would, I think we've got about. I want to respect y'all's time. We've got oh, about yeah, 20, like, 20 minutes. So oh, geez. no, no, this is great. <laughs> this has been awesome. It really has. It's been awesome. But I want to get into Boho Beautiful. Yeah. And then also, uh, I, th I think I might ask a question before this though, because you experienced some extreme bullying from like in adulthood or, or, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old from people that made it. And then looking down, like you said, and spitting on you from above and you experienced some, some bullying too. Mm. And y'all are parents. And uh, you shared last time with me, like you couldn't imagine if, uh, yeah. you know, Xavier was being bullied yeah. like that. But what's something that you took away from being bullied or mistreated that you've learned? And one thing that Amy told me recent, not recently, but it was during our relationship, there was someone that wasn't treating either someone or me Right. I mean, it was just kind of like an icky, nasty mm -hmm. feeling. And she said, hey, be grateful for that. That just showed you how not to treat somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like be be grateful for that. So I didn't know if there was any tidbits or knowledge that came to you guys through that moment or looking back on reflecting now where it's like, oh. A hundred percent. I think from experiencing, I can speak for myself mm -hmm. right now, but from experiencing what it feels like to be bullied and the unkindness and the hatred and all of those, that energy that is sent your way made me want to feel more passionate for others. If I ever see that, mm. like, of course the idea, like I mentioned, having my son be bullied, it's just like, it's really difficult to imagine because I think I would have had a, a lot of anger because of already knowing how that feels. So it's like, I've gone through the experience. So now I'm very passionate to, if you ever see any children or even adults bullying each other to not look away and to not step aside and, and to address like something you said that you guys do um, is if you notice bullying is say, that's not kind. Yeah. Like speaking out and just actually calling it out and putting that person on the spot, whoever's doing that unkindness to the other. And it's, it's facing it and, and speaking out and fighting for it. Um, for us, you know, it's, it's almost like leaked into, we're very passionate animal activists and, and we've, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. We, it's really led our work in, in speaking up for the voiceless of animals, mm. the ones that are being neglected and, and killed and all of those things and being that voice for them, because it's like, there's this deeper feeling of helplessness and I can't walk away from seeing that being done to an animal or to a person. And so to me, I, I feel like it's just really like really enriched this fire within me to, 
never look away or turn my eye the other way if I see somebody being bullied in any sort of form or way. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that like, it's interesting because I think it's really hard when you're in it to imagine the size of the world because the world seems so small when you're being dogpiled. Mm-hmm. And I can't imagine now with social media. If there, Oh my gosh, yeah, the social when media when I, component when I, like, is... When I was, when it was happening to me, like message boards on Angel Fires and GeoCity accounts was yeah. like a new thing. And yeah. that was like the end of the world when people would come on there and bully me publicly yeah. in, the, in the community space. Because that was mm-hmm. the only community space there was at that time. And it makes the world feel really small. It makes that seem like it matters so much. And it's impossible for me to say it without understanding that. But if it's happening to anyone out there, it's to know that life is so long and the world is so big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to know that like the strength that it takes inside to resist it, we all have, even though it seems impossible, the faith that's necessary to know to turn around and to, to stand your ground and to know that if you can find the strength to stand up, you'll not only survive, but you'll be stronger and you'll mm. be better off than you were before. And there will, like, like she said to you, like you'll learn something yeah. through it that will make you better than them. And not to say like, that's a thing to be like, I want to be better than someone, but like those are small people doing big things and to usually a big person, like, because we're all big but they make themselves small. So if they're doing it to you to sink to that level, I think it's, that's the tragedy to me. Cause I can't wrap my head around how to coach someone through that. And that's mm-hmm. why I'm fascinated by what you do. And why, when we had our podcast, I was asking about that mm-hmm. because I know if you make it through and like, there's a truth in it that can resonate that you can use as a power. Mm. Like they're giving you a power maybe in that sense. And if you can find the way to, to maneuver it, it like, I used it for everything. Like I, I, I started my own fucking band. Like fuck you guys, and I, and it was hard, and it was lonely, and it was alienating. And I got beat up at high school for it, and I, all the stuff. Like it was a, like I had a very tough like teenage years around that. Like especially because it wasn't cool to be in a band then. But through standing truth to like that to, to what you are and who you are, you can find how to be the biggest, most brightest, beautiful version of yourself. Mm-hmm. And maybe projecting that idea into the future and just focusing on that. And really like, you know, I think Juliana talks a lot about like using mantras in times mm. of strife. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm, you know, maybe that's, that's a key. I'm not sure. I guess yeah. I'm just kind of digesting well, even, through like, it all. Like using your energy and finding an outlet for it. I think yeah. that's important too. And maybe for, especially for kids these days, if they can't, if they feel suffocated by this energy that's being pushed on them. Well, where, where can you escape to that can actually better your life? So whether that is a sport, an art, or, you know, finding like a little club of people that have a similar interest in you, it's just finding an outlet to connect with people that's because beautiful. it can seem like the whole world is against you when it's five or six people yeah. that are pull, pushing or putting that energy on you, but that's not the reality. It's not the whole world against you because if you open your eyes, there are many people out there like family and other other friends that you can find and other surrounding yeah, areas. And other that friends we, you haven't met yet. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right? I started going to shows. Yeah. Yeah. I started meeting friends at shows from other cities around the Ajax. world is so yeah. big. It's and so for big. kids in yeah. school it can feel like that's their world, but it's mm. not. Because if they step out of it, like it's a whole beautiful universe of amazing people that will accept you and love you and be there for you. Because we're all enough. Yeah. We are. We mm-hmm. are all, we are exactly what we need to be. And anyone that wants to take that from you is a son of a bitch. Yeah. and doesn't deserve <laughs> to be in your life. So leave, yeah. find a place and come back to that. Like, there's, yeah. and, don't let the bastards And in the moments you that, yeah. you know, we've all gone through, it's like even looking back at our experiences and my personal experience of being bullied, I don't regret any of it. I don't feel sorry or victimized. Oh, I was bullied. Actually, everything that happened to me through my gymnastics and through the high school experiences, it has made me who I am today. Yeah, it wouldn't change a thing. Nothing. Yeah. Because it's built that strength. And, you know, you like, there's this, funny, we use this quote a lot, but it, there's this quote by Steve Jobs, which is funny. But <laughs> <laughs> he says, you know, you can never understand what's happened by looking forward, but you can always connect the dots by looking backwards. And mm. when you look at everything that's happened, the dots will connect and they will 
help you realize that everything that's happened, even most difficult traumatic experiences, had to happen to bring you to this place in your life. Like, look at you, Justin. Like, that story you shared with us, that moment, you know, with the costume party and the mm. dumpster, like, that was heartbreaking. But if you didn't have that experience, maybe you wouldn't have enough fire that you have right now to be doing this movement that you are and speaking out for bullying and for helping other children through it. So that traumatic experience actually was important to happen. So you would be here right now helping so many others through it. So if we Thank can you. see it that yeah. way, it's beautiful. Then you're like, none of this was a mistake. None of this mm. was a bad thing. It brought us here. Yeah, I think you just answered my next question, which was <laughs> thank you. No, it's great. I was going to say you at the beginning. Thank you, mm -hmm. Juliana, and thank you, Mark. And y'all are just amazing people. Amy, I might have you pull up um, Aubrey's quote that you uh, sent me the other day on Instagram. It's something about hindsight and foresight and things like oh, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But um, the name's Boho Beautiful, but how... How do you find or recognize or unearth the the beauty and the difficulty? Like like find the beauty inside of difficulty. Mm. Because I think probably a lot of what you'll do, even the beautiful things you make, the incredible videos, the stunning scenery, <laughs> the 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 beautiful art that in motion, the moving meditation on on the mats, um, it's all beautiful. But also, it's got to be difficult at times, like to get the right angle or to carry all the equipment there or uh, to travel there. Or yeah. you know, there's there's a lot of difficulties that come up, or days that you're feeling it and you plan for it, but a sickness comes up or. Or your little guy, yeah. Lionheart is, Xavier Lionheart is sick, you know? And uh, so how do you, how do you power through or remind yourself of the beauty whenever difficult things arise? Mm. I think. Does that a, come from yoga? Being yogis? I think, is that, I think there's a yoga, some yogic principle in that for sure. Okay. That I think maybe we didn't learn directly from yoga, but I think a lot of it might have come from earlier and then connected to yoga. Mm -hmm. But the world of duality and the difficult and the easy and the beautiful and the ugly, it's really all one. Mm. And yoga truly is about its union. And part of the process of our, of our journey, I think, has been to understand exactly what she said. The bullying was just as valuable as the victory she had because all of that together creates what the result is, mm -hmm. which is this moment, which now is no longer the result because it was just a moment ago mm -hmm. because it's constant and in motion. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's, what's really, what's really telling about everything we do is we, it's not easy and we fall off the fucking horse all the time. Mm -hmm. and, oh. Yeah. What happens behind the scenes? A lot of people don't see like, yeah, you know, cause it's yeah. shooting a video. It's like, Oh, it was a pretty video. No, like there was hours and hours of sweating in the sun and gear breaking and getting frustrated with a lot of elements like that all comes into the art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so it becomes about trying not to label the frustration. Yeah. Frustrating and trying not to label the difficulty as hard as it is, as difficult, but knowing that when you look back, the dots going to connect because it's, that's the process too. Yeah. And, in the end, the result to us is something we've tried our best to always ignore. When we started Bow Beautiful, the minute we started it, because we've been through so many little journeys in mm -hmm. our lives. Oh, I remember yeah. we posted our first video and it was terrifying and the world was gonna see a new side of both of us that no mm -hmm. one had ever seen before. We lied in bed that night and we said, no matter what happens, no matter if there's, and I remember saying, if, mm -hmm. if 10 people watch this video, or 10 million people watch this video, we can never ever focus on the result. We have to learn to love the process. Mm. And no matter what, what it brings. And it hasn't been easy. And it's it, like Juliana said earlier, I think she said like our, our business has become our life and our life has become our work. But at the same time, we've kind of wrapped it together and made it mission. Like we mm. just want to live in a service. And we know that's not always easy. Yeah. And I think the service component is definitely something that pushes us through it's those. The fuel. It, it is the fuel because, you know, when you receive an email or a message from someone that can say, wow, you know, you've helped me recover from depression or yeah. I've, you know, you've saved my life in one way or another, mm -hmm. which is, wow, it's, it's a big compliment, but you're like, 
it kind of connects the dots of, wow, you really are bringing this light mm. to people. And if whether five people get affected by it or five million, it doesn't matter. Because even if it's five people, their world has been changed in one way, one way or another. You know, you brought some light to them in a time where there is a lot of darkness in the world. And so, you know, for me, even sometimes when you're doing it, let's say a difficult shoot and it's like, I don't know, we've had very long days of shooting mm -hmm. sometimes in hot weather and I'm exhausted and tired. Like I'll close my eyes and I'll think about like, well, this video right now will help someone in a difficult time. Mm -hmm. and so it is my duty to be of service to the greater humanity to, you know, because people do click on our videos. That's great. So what can I do? How can I bring my energy to them? And so yeah. thinking of that always in difficult times or when you're tired or you don't feel like doing it. You yeah. Know, you have to think of the service and it's what fuels us. I love that. Well, you're both doing it. I think mm. Juliana, your story of even the, the recovery process from how much pain you're mm. in from literally your doctor or your, your father coming home as a doctor or nurse and, and yeah. giving you morphine so that you could compete to finding out your quote unquote, maybe some would label as losing that dream. Mm. Um, but you having to step away from it, but now you're able to help so many people heal through yeah. your practice and, and well, it's your interesting art. Interesting with the healing, I something that I kind of missed out of that story as well is in the background of the whole girl group and dancing, yoga, and I mentioned Pilates was my go to to really heal my body. And once I lost myself again after the whole disbanding of the girl group, I turned to the practice of yoga and self connection on the mat to find myself again and to find what really is me and my authenticity and my home. And that's been a huge healing part in my journey. So yoga has, has healed my life. It's changed my life. And so it's almost like to me now, everything that we do mm -hmm. with the service of yoga, it's my way of continuing to give something that it already brought to me. Mm. And I continue to study it. I'm, you know what I mean? I'm just sharing what I know now, but I'm still involved in this deep, <laughs> a discipleism of, of yoga. Cause you know, it's funny, I can't even call myself a teacher. We always talked about like, yeah. what is a yoga teacher? We don't like to even say we're yoga teachers because to be a teacher of yoga, that means, you know, you're teaching something you've already accomplished. But to us, we like to say we're disciples of yoga because we're still learning. You're still students. We're still no. students and yeah. we'll forever be students. Yeah. You know? Well, I think that's the best place to be instead of thinking there's nothing else to learn. Mm -hmm. Always having that being like a sponge yeah. and yeah. being willing to give it away too, like excitement. Oh, yeah. I just learned this and I can pass it on to you. Yeah. And oh, you haven't learned this yet. Well, let me show you how to do it. Do you feel the same way with wrestling and, and fighting? And um, I, yeah, for this, uh, world championship, this kind of like Olympic games of, uh, mm -hmm. of jujitsu. Um, it was fun. There was a guy that came in from Australia and man, he's big and strong, a former professional rugby player. And he dwarfs me in size. And, uh, I'm like, Whoa, this is a big boy. And I just saw a couple things because he's um, really progressed fast. Um, only been doing it like three or four years and was already at this highest level. Wow. Um, he won the Australian Open. Anyways, he's just Josh Sanders is his name. Great guy. But he was doing a few things, uh, fundamentals of wrestling that were just wrong. Um, but he, on the ground, he was great. But this big thing of wrestling is a big part of it. And so I showed him just a couple of things. Mm -hmm. And he was doing it in, in training. Then he was doing it at the match. And then we had dinner beforehand. And he was just like so excited about it. And uh, literally went against one of the most legendary guys ever um, in his first match there. Wow. <laughs> um, so it was just fun to be able to pass that on and him having that confidence uh, going into that match. And then I know we're, we're close to wrapping up. So Mark, we have six minutes. Yeah, great. Mark, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you... I think it's awesome your story because because you've got you've had such a both of you have had such a beautiful journey but going from punk rock in your van to quote unquote having it all to leaving it all to music or record label executive to then be like no that's not right but meeting each other I mean you're I think you're giving um you're empowering people to say hey I'm not in the right place and I'm going to listen to that voice. It's so important. Both of you. Yeah. It's so fucking important. Yeah. There's so, I think we live in a world where fear is such a part of our culture. And I think that seeps mm. into every aspect of everybody's life. And the fear of change mm. is one of the biggest 
obstacles I've had to overcome and I re- I've recognized it every time and I I don't know how I've managed to do it except for the fact that I think physically I, my body just somehow innately tells me mm. when it's wrong but I think we all have a meter to check in in that intuition yeah. and when our intuition speaks it's I'm so passionate that people mm. have to listen and changing your life you can always change it back making decisions to do something positive for yourself like you can always not do it if it doesn't feel right. Like waking up an hour earlier or changing what you eat or getting on the mat and trying yoga for the first time or, you know, being like, hey, I'd love to try jujitsu and, mm-hmm. you know, like trying different things. Like we have this life. We have so like such a short blink of time to be mm-hmm. here, like doing the same thing if it doesn't feel right seems so crazy, but it's such a, a like it's such a reset for people. It's so easy to lean back into it rather than say like, I'm going to try something else. Yeah. We have so like, it's such a beautiful thing to me. Like, I don't understand how we built a culture that actually discourages people to, to be more because we can always be more. We're here to grow. Mm. We're here to evolve. We're here to expand. So it's, I think it's, it's like our, our God given like duty to try our best to, to push those envelopes Mm -hmm. and to know when you're not in the right place, just pivot. Yeah. Always pivot back. I love like, that. It's, it's, I don't know. I love that. Uh, and I think we do. We're so quick to run away from difficulty and run towards comfort. Yeah. And when you said fear, I was thinking, man, uh, at treatment, when I was at rehab, they had uh, a quote on the wall and it was fear and it was, uh, fear everything and run or face everything and rise. Mm. And I was just like, oh, you know, you wow. have two choices. Two what kind of fear? So yeah. fear everything and run or face everything and rise. That's incredible. And I was wow. like, I was like, I like that. I, I like, like that, that a lot actually. Yeah. Amy, could you read that quote and we'll see if they can riff on it just for oh, a the minute. One from Aubrey? Yeah, the one yeah, from yeah. Aubrey. Read that. We'll riff on it and we'll close this out. A... And I want, I want you guys to also be able to plug everywhere. People can find oh, you sure. where they can go find a, a prenatal uh, yoga video, right? Yep. Of you pregnant doing okay. it if they're pregnant or, <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is from Aubrey. It says, think back to a year ago. Remember what was bothering you? Is it still bothering you? How about a month ago? How about a week ago? Whatever you're going through will pass. And in hindsight, you'll be grateful for what it taught you. So why not use hindsight as foresight? Hmm. That's really beautiful. Wow. The dots connect. <laughs> the dots connect. That's yeah. you always, maybe yeah. that's why I was reminded of it. Yeah. Yeah. Saying it. yeah. I think it's the realization that wherever you are in this moment is, is exactly where you need to be. And like we were saying, anything good or bad that has happened, it was there for, for your growing, for your expansion. And we have to face those difficult moments in strength, knowing that no matter what you're going through, you will get through it. And when you do, you're going to come out that much stronger, that much more wiser, that much more loving, you know, whatever it is that is there to teach you. And I don't know, that's my, I guess, my spiritual connection as well. I truly believe that nothing is given to us without a purpose. I think they can Mm -hmm. imagine, you know, you can imagine what it might take to get through it and then Mm -hmm. find the way to believe in it. And once you have that, just the idea, even if it's just for a split second, to quickly make a decision to do one thing, just to change. And then that can start a chain reaction of momentum that can change your entire life. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's beautiful. And I think like life when you're in those hard short. places, I look back at the things I think were a big deal yesterday and I'm like, my God, yeah, yeah. like really <laughs> like yesterday, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, going to do a podcast and I was all stressed out or whatever. And like, Oh, I hope it's good. You know, and you make this whole thing in your mind and it's all fabricated. It's all from fear. Like you yeah. create this apparatus to like exist inside. And it's like, that was a choice. So I mean, it's unconscious, but it was a choice to allow it to happen. Mm-hmm. Where if I just breathed into it and said, you know what? In, we said this a lot this trip in 24 hours, we're going to actually look back at this mm-hmm. and we're going to be like, wow, we had no idea what that was going to yeah. be. And to yeah. surrender to the unfolding of it is yeah. like, that's kind of the magic of life. Yeah, sometimes it it's hard and sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's scary as fuck. But at the end of the day, like you get through it and you look back and you're like, and then it did, it doesn't exist anymore. You know, yeah. like you're just like, and it's also the awesome. idea of looking at something that scares you and asking yourself, how much is it, is it real? And how much of it is it just your own mind? It's like fear. There's another little interpretation of it is false evidence appearing real. Mm. 
Yep. Right. So it's like, it's actually your mind that's making you feel fearful, but you know, are you actually going to be, you know, bitten by a snake right now? Like that's real fear when you're seeing something that can physically hurt you, but something that you're projecting of being scary or, oh, this could change my life. Maybe it will, maybe I'll fail. Maybe I'll succeed. That's just your own projections of something that hasn't even happened. You know, so move forward on that and see yeah. what happens. And even if it fails, oh. that's a learning curve. Failure is not a failure. We all need to fail. I think we've all had to fail to realize our true power. And how like, to tweak it. And, and how to tweak it and how to be better the next time. And, and the mistakes that you've made, you won't make again. Like all of these things are just like, it's all part of this divine, beautiful journey that we're here to go through as, as these souls and human bodies. You know, it's, yeah. it's our learning. It's our school here on earth. We're just learning. School here on earth. I yeah. like that. Yeah. And um, just in closing, we'll put all this in the show notes, but how can people follow you, support you? And buy your yoga videos because I think I want to do some of them. <laughs> um, well, we have free content on our YouTube yeah. channel, Boho Beautiful. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds of videos there. You can follow us on Instagram, which is a little bit more of a personal representation of us, which is Boho Beautiful Life. And we have our full streaming app as well, which is called Boho Beautiful Official, where we have you know live streams and full long versions of exclusive yoga, Pilates, meditation classes mm. all that fun stuff even diet even, even nutrition, nutrition. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. nutrition yeah. stuff too well, you'll just give surprisingly it all surprisingly good at yoga oh okay yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we, we can go more. to yoga sometime and go to casa de luz before or after there we right. go so amazing we, you guys like that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we love that place we yeah. love the casa de luz we've been yeah. there many yeah. times the last yeah. trip oh my god awesome <laughs> well <laughs> thank you all so much for being here this was such a treat i even think we should maybe do it again yeah i'd probably do it again i'd love that so yeah grateful for you Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Overcome with Justin Wren. I'm so incredibly grateful you were here. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did with Mark and Juliana's uh, just perspective on life, on relationships, on pursuing your purpose with passion. Please follow them uh, on YouTube at Boho Beautiful. Also, um, Boho Beautiful Life on Instagram and go follow them on Instagram. Go follow and watch and listen to the YouTube Stars and Destruct podcast. I was the latest guest on that show and they're just incredible people who have started this project, the Karma Project.life for Fight for the Forgotten. And we've blown through two goals so far, $20,000 and then $40,000. We've raised $43,000 so far because of 1,233 incredible people. We'd love for you to join us. Uh, join forces with us. Donate to this project. I just got back uh, from Uganda with Amy, the producer of the show, and it was the best trip of my life of 12 years going back and forth uh, to spend time with my beautiful pygmy family. Um, seeing the progress that's been made has been so incredible and them on their new land, them farming it, them having clean water, new homes, beds and mosquito nets, latrines and hand washing stations and showers. Um, it's just absolutely awesome. And now we're getting ready to do a real hospital, medical clinic and school and a community hub. So we're just so excited for all the projects, solar, wind, energy. Um, and so that's all within this project, the karma project dot life which is also on fightfortheforgotten.org. Thanks so much for tuning in and uh, thank you for being here. I'm very, very grateful. Hey, don't forget to send your Overcome stories to overcomepodcast at gmail.com. And also rate, review, subscribe, and follow Overcome with Justin Wren.